So hi, I'm Eric Sorensen. I'm the product manager for OSPO at GitHub. I've been a hubber since last August. Come on in, folks. It's, you're just about to beat the rush and get the good seats. So feel free to find a spot anywhere. Um, prior to starting at GitHub last year, I worked at Puppet for about eight and a half years. And prior to that, I spent most of my career as a systems administrator and an SRE with a focus on what's now known as DevOps, but at the time was just called configuration management. Worked in the open source community there for a long time, and it's really great to be back amongst my people here. Um, today I'm gonna talk about open source at GitHub. Uh, I'm the product manager for our open source program office, and GitHub has a, a unique position, I think, with respect to the open source community. Software development generally is deeply collaborative, and sort of the largest world, the world's largest team sport. Uh, open source software is, uh, don't have to belabor the point for this audience, but enabling organizations and individuals to collaborate that we can all use to get together to build better solutions. <clears throat> there are great advantages to doing this, and uh, at GitHub we've seen some tremendous growth, particularly in the past few years where things seem to be uh, catching on in the mainstream in a way that um, previously, we'd only really dreamt of. Uh, GitHub as a company is committed to helping our customers make better, uh, make a better world through open source. In this presentation, I'll talk about that through the perspective of our open source program office. So we truly believe that open source is a differentiator for enterprises, uh, and our mission is to enable organizations and individuals to achieve more. This is a quote from Thomas Donkey, our CEO, uh, and he spent much of his career as a developer, and I have to honestly say it's been uh, wild and refreshing to have people at the highest levels of the um, executive chain at GitHub who really, truly get it about open source. We're not having to constantly justify the rationale and the investments behind why we do what we do. Um, we really get it and have, uh, continue to pervade the DNA of the company with a, a deep commitment to open source. There's sort of a outdated stereotype of open source as the realm of hardcore hackers and fringe hobbyists. It's really completely invalid now. It's squarely in the mainstream to the extent that if you're at an enterprise that isn't establishing an open source brand, uh, which a phrase which I hate, but there's no better option, uh, you're probably losing out to a competitor who is. And just on the merits, uh, open source and the enterprise means that your developers can focus on building differentiated value instead of toiling away on commodity or utility components. Uh, you're not in the container scheduling business, or if you are, you should probably rethink that plan. You're not in the logging framework business or any one of the hundreds of necessary but already invented wheels that go into a complex, complex application. But being able to use an existing library really accelerates your development cycle. It lets you leverage the power community and enables you to focus on what matters to the business. But as Scott Neely said a long time ago, open source is free like a puppy is free. It's not free like free pizza. Uh, it comes with a set of responsibilities and different risks that many enterprises are not used to. And it's particularly relevant if you care about doing open source right and uh, being a good open source citizen which is a phrase that I've heard several times over the past couple of days and re-engaging in the community in an authentic way instead of sort of plundering the labor of others and uh, um, not contributing back and becoming part of the community. So at GitHub, we don't uh, inherently do everything right, but I do think we have a pretty good perspective on open source and enterprise. And first and foremost, we are a software company just like any other, and we've gone through our own journey um, with multiple twists and turns with open source. So I'll start talking about that. So we have a strong open source program that encourages contributions, that respects the license obligations, and allows engineers to use open source with ease to work out on the open and release their own projects while still maintaining security and compliance. At GitHub, we see that our developers are using open source in order to get their jobs done more effectively. We're using something like 45,000, that number's probably higher now, different open source components across all of the software that GitHub builds and uh, ships. And 
this allows them allows us to focus on uh, innovating, as I mentioned before, to sort of eliminate a bunch of that toil and focus on what really building things that really matters. One interesting thing that happens too when the employees are allowed to uh, contribute freely to open source is that the distance between developers and the customers shrinks, and they don't need to go through uh, support, sales, product management necessarily to learn how their software is being used and what the customers want. They directly interact with people using it, and that's satisfying to developers as well as to customers who get their needs heard directly. And this is going back to that point about uh, establishing a brand. We have heard from a lot of uh, um, OSPAs that I talk to amongst our customers that it's really important in a uh, hiring market to have established credibility as a organization that participates in uh, in the open source ecosystem uh, to be more attractive to job seekers. Um, so a big part of the depth and the breadth of this adoption is cultural. We have what's called a balanced intellectual property employment agreement that says that employees are welcome to work on open source outside of work. So if the passion project that you have for working on Arduino stuff or RasPies or whatever is, uh, that there's no inherent uh, approvals that you need to go through in order to work on those kinds of things. And additionally, for things which are work related, there's really just some very minimal impediments to uh, contributing upstream and to working out in the open. And for projects which are developed internally and which we want to release out into the open source world, that's also, uh, I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, but we have a pretty streamlined process for a developer that's built something uh, and wants to release it out in the world to, get, to uh, make that happen. And I'll talk more about each one of these points, but the, the idea here is that we want to both you know, help, help the projects that we work on to share and maintain our own stuff and work on the community while still maintaining some of the, um, uh, the, the same kind of compliance and uh, um, intellectual property uh, protections that every other or organization has. So we're heavily involved in upstream projects to the extent that there are engineers and whole teams at GitHub that are dedicated to work, working upstream and in ecosystems that are critical to the business. There's just a few of them. Um, the Git, obviously, we uh, have core maintainers on the Git, on, uh, the Git project, and um, the programming languages and frameworks that we use most frequently also get upstream involvement. From an ecosystem standpoint, there are, these, these are more uh, open source sort of platforms for hosting artifacts and building a marketplace that GitHub's also involved in. There's a few larger projects that started off as independent open source, like Dependabot or NPM, or things that were created by GitHub initially, like the desktop and CLI client that started off as uh, open source from the, from the very beginning. Foundation-led open source is increasingly the way work gets done out in the community, and that's been an interesting shift for me personally because the infrastructure tools where I started off in my uh, open source uh, career, like Puppet, Chef, Docker, Terraform, those were you know, coming out about 10 years ago and were really, they were nominally open source, but were really dominated by a single vendor in a lot of ways. And uh, where they were an open core project that was tied into a larger commercial thing. And so the, past, the shift over the past few years uh, towards foundation-led open source, obviously the CNCF and the Linux Foundation, which is why we're here, um, are sort of leading that charge. Um, and clearly there's companies that are built around CNCF projects, but it's very difficult to walk in with a thing that you've built as a single vendor and find success in those communities. It's more about working with the special interest groups and uh, building collaborative relationships with people that are also working on the same problem space and then moving on into implementation. So at GitHub we want all of this to succeed because more open source equals more good. And we want to continuously improve what we can do as a platform, uh, as the platform where so much of this discussion, design, development, and support, and community interaction actually happens. Culturally, we try to work in the open as much as possible, and I'll talk a little bit more about the mechanisms behind that. But I think it's really important to model the community interactions that we want to improve. So these are a few things that we're 
you know, pretty adamant about um, publishing and keeping in the open. The docs, entire doc system for docs at github.com is open source. Um, Primer is our design system. I had a really good conversation with a couple of folks yesterday about open source in design and how people are reinventing things over and over again, like icon sets and that sort of thing. And it's not really differentiated value. If, obviously, design is really important, but you know, making a, a pixel by pixel representation of a save file icon is not something that people need to keep reinventing. Um, and Primer is sort of our uh, use both for everything that's on GitHub and in our products. It's also an open source um, uh, site at primer.github.com that you can go and check out. Um, the roadmap is interesting. There's a uh, repository at GitHub slash roadmap that uh, has all of the things that are flagged as being public um, uh, in the internal roadmap project. And uh, it's a great way to get co community and customer feedback on issues and to be as transparent as possible about the things that we're trying to, um, uh, that we're trying to accomplish in the future. That said, there, uh, there are um, exceptions and not, you know, some, some restrictions may apply towards uh, working in the open. Obviously not everything is open source. And I think that's true for every company. Um, uh, in some cases, the tools and the uh, projects that I'll talk about here are not open source because they just aren't open yet, but they could be. And in some cases, the teams made a decision not to open something because even if it was potentially a good candidate because there's a non-zero cost doing that. It does, uh, you know, it, once you put it on the world, like my Scott Manili quote a minute ago, it's uh, sort of like giving a free puppy. You do have to continue to feed and care for it over the lifetime of the project. And so, some, so sometimes we'll make a strategic decision not to open source something. So a bit more about that roadmap item. Uh, if you want to check this out, it's, it's uh, amazing the level of detail that you can get into. And if there's a particular problem with, that you're having with GitHub, I would encourage you to look here first and see if there's already an issue that you could uh, comment on, add your, add your voice or your use case to. Um, some things are obviously not on there. So like Copilot, for example, wouldn't show up on this until it was actually launched. But for in-market features, we really do encourage teams to keep the public roadmap updated and to get real-time feedback from the customers and community through that way. Under the hood, there's a private repository with a superset of all these issues. And the ones that are tagged as being public roadmap periodically get synced out to the, uh, out to the public repo. So that'd be something to think about for your organization. Um, uh, you know, obviously, we heavily use GitHub issues, so it's easy to, to implement that sort of automation. But I think, in general, the idea there are some, uh, there are plenty of other companies that have opened up their product roadmap. Um, GitLab, for example, has taken this to a radical extreme and has literally everything on their roadmap going out a couple of years. Uh, but um, it, it's a amazing, it's amazing to see what people are interested in and to get that near real time feedback about what's. Uh, um, what's important to your customers and your, user, and your community. So though we've been working in open source for a long time, in 2021, GitHub established a formal OSPO program to sort of centralize governance and coordinate activity around managing our own open source projects and working upstream. This is the group that I'm in, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how we work and what we're, what we're doing. Our mission overall is to as it says, help individuals innovate more through open source. But we're in an interesting position of having sort of a dual role, where we maintain our own open source projects and work on things inside of GitHub, as well as help um, everybody out in, the, in our customer base and in the wider community that are using GitHub as the central point for their open source activity to do so more effectively. And we kind of think of this in terms of Program, the program side and product side. Programs being things that are internal facing work that help us primarily and products being outward facing work. On, and I'll dive into each of these in a little more detail, but just to give you a quick overview from a program standpoint, we're really con concerned with the problem of license compliance. We're working on uh, durable ownership. Uh, when at Chaos Con, um, Sylvia mentioned this co concept of sustainability and to Divor, or to differentiate between a point in time uh, project health from the idea of how long uh, and how sustainable is that over the long term. 
uh, resilience was a was a term that came up as a um, more descriptive phrase for that. We were, we're using the term durability. That just means that the uh, projects that are out there in open source have a defined maintainer that we know uh, who is responsible for them, and they have sort of a SLO in the same way that the uh, uh, software that runs internally does. And the release process, I mentioned that a moment ago, and we'll, we'll get in, into more detail. On the product side, personally, I think this is really interesting. We're building things into GitHub that help people work at that intersection of large organizations, large enterprises, and the open source communities that they work in. So our primary user here is the OSPO manager, which I think there are several here. And so I'm really concerned with the problems of how do you use GitHub to maintain and manage the open source that you both have generated internally and have um, maintainership over, as well as working upstream in projects and communities that are outside of ones that are uh, uh, under your purview. We have a dashboard that shows organizational health metrics, and I'll show an example of that. Um, the Open OSPO project is something that I'm really keenly interested in uh, hearing your, your responses about. We've open sourced a bunch of the policies and procedures, as well as some tools and guides that we use internally, and are trying to see if those are helpful for people that are um, bootstrapping their own open source program office to just have a template or a starting point for things like a contribution policy for your employees to work on open source. And the last one is sort of a catch-all bucket of friction fixes around things that are you know, maybe cross-cutting concerns that are primarily affecting uh, OSPO managers, but may also be um, uh, painful for maintainers of large open source projects, but the things that wouldn't necessarily bubble up to the top of any one product team's backlog. At the OSPO, we can sort of look across, uh, broadly across the platform and say, can we help out people who are um, you know, experiencing pain in this particular area, can we dive in to this part of the code base and help improve that for, our, for the customers that we care about the most. So I'll talk a little bit more about these programs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, we use a ton of uh, upstream projects to build GitHub. There are lots of dependencies across thousands of repos, and many of them got pulled in back in the distant, misty past, so there wasn't good governance around their usage. So one of the first projects that we undertook was to get a handle on what those dependencies were to mitigate the risk, particularly of uh, software that we distribute and ship out to customers of uh, unapproved licenses. So the idea is to implement a get clean workflow, that is to get to the point where we understand the current state of things, we uh, have everything uh, nicely bucketed and we know where there are exceptions, what those exceptions are. Um, to try to be minimally annoying and not bug people unnecessarily. Uh, a lot of the times if people have a license or if the license data is, is incomplete in their repo, they're the only people who can go in and really understand what the, what the ramifications are of fixing that. But to alert people unnecessarily and to cause a, um, a bunch of chaos amongst the development teams would not be a successful way to go about this, so we want it to be minimally intrusive. And lastly, to sort of do this with an eye towards potential future productization, to think about what this would look like for um, if, if we were to make it available for, um, for customers. And just to get into a little bit more detail about this, there are some cool uh, open source components of this project. The, the overall thing itself is, uh, again, one of those things I mentioned at the beginning that the team made a decision to uh, implement in a particular way and not to open source the whole thing, but there's definitely big pieces of it which are reusable and which are um, working in the open. The biggest of which is a project called Clearly Defined, which is a service that is now under the purview of the OSI, uh, which is a, a, serv a service that runs uh, with uh, th tens of thousands of packages and their license, uh, license information about them and the provenance of those packages. So we use that as a source of truth for finding out license information. Um, we've written and open sourced a uh, Go library called um, Go SPDX. Uh, we've, we've seen a couple of talks this, in the, over the past couple of days about SPDX. This uh, library allows you to express in the SPDX language uh, a list of permissible licenses, and the service compares 
that policy against the results for packages that it scanned from repositories against the clearly defined database and uh, opens up issues if there are, um, by, if there's something that's on a disallowed list. Um, it's a big, it's a big undertaking. It's been a big project. Uh, we've learned some interesting lessons as we've gone through it. Um, there were uh, not, it was not a huge uh, set of repositories that had problems, which is the first one. Like you kind of look at that, pro at the number of them and the state of things and worry that it's going to be, you know, tens of thousands of alerts and it's gonna be a massive undertaking to try to fix them. It's actually a relatively small number of repositories that were affected and about a thousand total uh, issues that were that initially came up after we sort of cut down the uh, initial pro uh, data uh, quality problems. And even amongst those 350, most of those were uh, just bad data, like a license file that wasn't in the right place or had uh, terminology that the software couldn't parse correctly. Very, very few of those required actual code changes, like the, where the absolute kind of last step in the chain of having to fix something is you have used, you've in included this dependency, the dependency uh, is written in a way that has an incompatible license and there's no, there's no way around that and so we have to change the code that we've written in order to use a different library or use a different implementation. And I don't, of those 350, I think there have been zero of those cases. Like we haven't found anything we've had to actually go in and retool in order to fix a, a uh, irrevocable problem with. Uh, but despite all that, it's still pretty annoying. We've definitely got some feedback from the developers as the issues were opened up in their repositories that uh, the documentation needs to be clearer. Um, the, the chatbot interactions that uh, are available in the issues are maybe not as uh, intuitive as they would have liked, so we're still trying to work on the developer experience and the UX around making that less obnoxious. And ultimately, yeah, more, more and better documentation, more automation to go through and fix those things would be, would be great. Um, additional curation of the um, clearly defined data always helps and having, being able to send in a pull request to the upstream source of truth for that data means that everybody that is affected by, that, by a bad license gets, uh, or bad, bad license information gets the benefit of it. And uh, additionally, as we expand the scope, uh, more dry runs and just sort of eliminating those um, spurious alerts was, w would be a, a huge boon to the end users. Yeah, and as I mentioned, you can see the, uh, get the Go SPDX library uh, that's available and uh, clearly find itself is uh, you know, the service runs and you can communicate with it over API, but the service is itself uh, open source. So, uh, as I mentioned, we we're really uh, also interested in this problem of durability and durable ownership. We use the term durability around internal software components indicating that it's got human owners uh, who agree that they are maintainers. That's an important part of it, not just that they're tagged in a file somewhere, but they uh, also have agreed to, to uh, take on that responsibility, that it has an SLO that's appropriate to the criticality and that the users of that uh, component have a path to getting support for it. So last year we started a project to extend this to open source projects under the GitHub organizational umbrella. There's a bunch of work here involving getting an inventory of these organizations, migrating them to a new enterprise management to separate out the internal repositories from those with external collaborators, bringing the unmanaged organizations into uh, our access control system, and then adding the ones that were actually live into a service catalog that you can see here, so they live alongside of the internal software and that they have um, a clear path of ownership and all, all of the good things that come along with that. There we go, I thought this one was gonna build out too. Some lessons learned from here. Um, so if you are uh, in a similar situation in your organization where you're trying to wrangle a large mass of open source that has been written over the course of several years and maybe has un unclear provenance, uh, maybe you can learn from the work that we've been doing. 
The first one is uh, to go invent a time machine and go back in time before all that stuff is created and prevent it from going out the door in the first place without, uh, without having the, this kind of ownership setting. In the absence of that, uh, um, try to get a, a handle on it as early as possible because the more, longer you delay, the more uh, chaotic it becomes um, and the harder it becomes to, to wrangle. Uh, it's important to backstop those written policies with automation and tools. Uh, so it's one thing to say that um, you can't create new organizations. It's another thing to actually physically prevent that from happening inside of, the, inside of your tooling. Um, and ideally, you want to make it easy to do the right thing. Like, I think most developers want to do the right thing, but it often can be confusing or difficult to know what that is. If you also make it so that there are checks and balances or protections upstream of the point at which they could go wrong that helps uh, keep them on the paved path and uh, um, makes it easier to stay clean over time. And this last one is around providing incentives and not just deterrence. I mean, I think this is true broadly speaking, but in, in, the, in this case, we want to um, show them that even though there's some work that you have to do or there might be some changes you have to make, that there's benefits at the end of it. In the, in the case of, say, this migration into a, uh, another organization, it meant that they didn't have to go through an onerous onboarding process to add external collabora collaborators to an open source project. They could just go ahead and add them uh, ad hoc as, as they wanted to because it was no longer, uh, there's no longer a risk of associating them with a, um, with an enterprise, so that was appealing, and so we wanted to highlight that and make that as easy as possible for folks. <clears throat> Last program piece that I want to talk about is our open source release process, and this policy and the process itself is available in that um, uh, GitHub OSPO repo that I mentioned. You can um, use the templates that are there to start this, uh, start up a repository for yourself that has uh, some of the same uh, setup that, that we use at GitHub. Uh, it starts off with a, with a written policy that's around how you can release open, uh, a piece of software they've written internally as open source. And it's obviously something that needs to be get buy-in from across your organization, from your legal department, from the other stakeholders that are uh, that are involved in that. But once it's established and published, it, uh, it's a you're, you're done and you can just point back at the policy for people that are, um, it, that are working on software. Um, the policy points at the implementation, which is in a repository that, which, that has those issue templates that I mentioned. Uh, users can go in, make a new issue, fill out a pretty simple form. It's quite, maybe it has gotten um, procedural scar tissue over time as all uh, process does but uh, it's still pretty, pretty uh, compact that describes what the software is that they want to release, what the, um, you know, whether there's any um, burdensome intellectual property concerns that we might, be want, we might want to be concerned about, any cryptographic related things, like those kinds of things, um, and a short checklist of things that they can do to make sure that the repository is in good shape to be open source. That is, does it have uh, clear, code of conduct file, a clear license, a clear set of maintainers. Once, that's, once the issues are in, we have a periodic um, triage amongst the OSPO team where we go through and review all the issues that have come in since the last time, as well as ones that have, we've been shepherding along the process but aren't quite through, uh, have back and forth with the folks that are responsible for the software and uh, have open office hours where they can drop in and frequently we'll just work through one uh, person's problem dur during that office hours and get their uh, code released at the end of the office hour session. So that, that works out really well. Um, and then once it's, once it's out, um, the, the question of sustainability and maintenance comes in for those, for those releases. And hopefully if they've gone through the process correctly, they are now set up for success with respect to um, you know, a list of maintainers, some external collaborators who can help out with issues and pull requests and those kinds of things. Um, and again, I'll put the URL up in a minute, but this is, this is all, all um, available for you to use as a starting point for your own organization. It works really well. It's, um, I think, one of the more satisfying uh, parts of the job that I do. It's really great to work with the developers internally and to 
help them take something that they've written and you know have been maybe been trying for um, uh, to, to get traction on for a while and actually get it out into the world. It, it's uh, it's a, a pretty fun process. So I've been talking a lot. I'm going to pause for just a moment here. If, if there's any questions about any of those program pieces I just t talked about, I'm happy to take them now um, and frame them on the next section. Okay, go ahead. Are the, sustain, are the issues of clearly defined resolved now? Is that a question? I believe so. Um, it's definitely been, um, uh, had uh, some atten additional attention put on it in the past, uh, in, in recent two, two to three months. And I think the transition over out of um, being purely a Microsoft project and on to, into the purview of the OSI means there's a dedicated uh, per, uh, person that's responsible for it and that has, uh, that, you know, whose job it is to care about and maintain the, the service itself. So I think we're in, in, a better, in a better shape than we were several months ago and on the right trajectory. Yeah, the question is how uh, recursive is the checking for license compliance? Yeah, it goes through a full dependency tree for, so if you have a uh, you know, package.json that pulls in files, that pulls in files, it will, it'll recurse all the way through there and, and check those. Oh my God, I knew that was gonna happen. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, sorry, I'm a, I'm a sound guy myself and I just put my water next to the amplifier and I'm like mortified that I did that, sorry. Ah, oh, lordy, okay, I'm gonna keep going. This is our drinking, the drinking our own champagne section. So what parts of GitHub do we use to foster collaboration and open source culture? Um, Sponsorships, we, uh, if you're in the room earlier, uh, Mike and Cheryl from Stripe gave a great talk about uh, how they use GitHub sponsors at Stripe to build a sustainable um, set of, uh, of open source dependencies that they contribute monetarily towards. Um, sponsorships really do m move the needle for maintainers, particularly sponsorships from organizations. Uh, like a single organization sponsor can make a project more sustainable than 100 individual sponsorships. Um, Steph Lincoln, who runs the program, wanted me to mention that the average uh, sponsorship from an organization, it, it tends to be about 14 times what an individual sponsorship is, and so it can really, really help out for uh, projects that are underfunded, that are trying to um, uh, find a path towards sustainability and to, um, uh, take um, uh, to, to scale up their, their work. Um, so we've been focused on removing friction so that organizations can sponsor at scale, like adding invoice payments and a dashboard for insight. Um, these features are now available to all organizations and they said we use sponsorships ourselves to help fund uh, pro um, projects that, uh, that we rely on at GitHub. We heavily use discussions internally, um, and I, I chatted with somebody the other day who has wanted to uh, uh, encourage more collaboration amongst their, uh, the, the developers in their organization, but because everything was centered in issues, they felt like it was a high bar for people that weren't necessarily technically involved with that code base to get involved and to participate in a meaningful way. At GitHub, we use discussions to solve exactly that problem, and uh, there's a sort of an internal philosophy that everything should have a URL, and having a discussion about a, a question that you have or a problem uh, gives that problem a distinct URL that people can go to, they can contribute to, they can chime in on the discussion with what feels like a lower uh, level of maybe commitment or a lower cognitive barrier than uh, having to go and make a pull request or to create an issue. They can just chime in on a discussion and have their voice heard that way. Um, 
this is heavily used in engineering and company-wide communications, and individual teams have really adopted this workflow for uh, talking about things that are in the early design phases and haven't quite yet moved into a more formal kind of engineering plan. I talked a minute ago about the metrics dashboard. This is a product piece that we in the OSPO engineering have built and are um, uh, have made available to users on an uh, opt-in beta basis. Um, it, it's, um, we really focused on surfacing these community standards and making it so that you could, as a OSPO manager or as somebody who is responsible for a large number of open source um, repos in an organization, you could find ones that were missing a readme or missing a code of conduct or had a license that was uh, incompatible with, uh, with your policy, as well as to surface some of the contribution data and project activity uh, to, so you could see um, projects that were becoming stale and where, where the activity levels were tapering off and weren't getting as much um, uh, interaction with the community as they had been, say, three or four months ago. And there's a quick snapshot of it. Um, we're at a place with this where we're um, finished up the beta and are looking at what we need to move on to the next phase. I had some great conversations at ChaosCon with folks. And I'd love to talk with any of you if you're interested in this, this sort of metric and this question of uh, getting uh, your arms around the uh, state of the repositories that are across your organizations and finding out um, maybe problem spots where a maintainer is burned out or maintainers have left and there's a backlog of pull requests that, uh, that aren't being addressed or conversely projects that have unexpectedly gotten popular and uh, need, need more love and attention in order to break through to the next level. So I'd love to chat with you more about that. If you're interested in it, come find me afterwards. So as I've mentioned a couple of times, many of these policies that I've talked about are available in this open OSPO project. So this repository at um, GitHub slash GitHub dash OSPO. Uh, we're gonna keep adding more resources over time, but the contribution policy, the open source release process are, are up there today as well as the templates for new repos that you might make in your organization and some more guide how-to kinds of docs. So check it out. Let me know if there's anything on there um, that uh, you, you, you find useful for your organization or more types of things that you'd like to see, either other, other things I've talked about today or things that would be helpful to you to expand the open source practices inside your organization. So we have a uh, community that um, we started up. I mentioned discussions earlier. There's a, um, uh, a OSPO-focused discussion area uh, underneath community slash OSPO. Um, this initially started off as a way for the beta users to provide feedback on the dashboard, but we've gotten uh, discussions started from uh, folks asking for feature requests in other parts of GitHub. There was a great discussion with uh, Jordan and with uh, Tierney around uh, two-factor authentication and, and how we could improve the workflow of rolling out 2FA. Um, the GitHub OSPO one that I mentioned, and uh, just a shout out too to the uh, to-do group OSPology uh, repo, which has a ton of great information, particularly if you're getting started, you're uh, trying to figure out how you can uh, establish an OSPO or establish open source practice inside your organization, you want help doing that. That's all I've got. Thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I honestly can't believe I spilled water all over the receiver. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sure, so the question is about the uh, dashboard beta. What are the next steps now that the beta is closed? The first one is that we are um, exploring options for um, a different backend data store, so that the hitting our target of organizations that we wanted to onboard uh, coincided, unfortunately, with the rapid sunset of the platform that we're using on the back end there. 
So we've got to rethink that a little bit. But part of it is um, making the, the data that people find most valuable available in the GitHub APIs. So you can incorporate that into your own dashboards and uh, make it, um, you know, incorporate with your own data sets that maybe I've um, had requests for wanting to overlay things like that PR uh, close rate over an SLO, which is an internal bit of data that we don't have insight into. Uh, if we make that available, available through the API, that becomes a lot easier for you to uh, build on your own. So, that, so yeah, investigating a new backend, making that stuff available through the API, and figuring out um, what the whether we're um, whether we can enable it for uh, organizations on demand instead of it having to go through kind of a manual onboarding process. That's sort of what's up up next for it. And I'm sorry about the timing there. It's probably unfortunate. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So are the, the question is when the license compliance scanner finds a problem with the license, what are we, what, what's next? Are we making recommendations about what, what they ought to do? Again, it really depends on what the nature of the problem is. And we have a few steps, which uh, are, uh, to your to your later point of your question, what how can we make that that information available? Certainly, the process and the the decision tree that we've built is a good candidate to add into the uh, open source repo and to make that available because it's implementation agnostic, uh, and it might be helpful for, to answer questions like this. But it really is like a, a sort of a flow chart of decision making about is the problem that the license data is incomplete or inaccurate? If so, can we fix that uh, in, the, in clearly defined in the upstream source of truth, or do we need to fix it in the repository? If we need to fix it in the repository, is it something that's really like, maybe it's a typo where they put, you know, A-P-A-C-H-W -A instead of Apache, and we can just fix that typo and improve the, the quality of it? That's a surprising number of things like that are, are, are really easy to fix. Uh, if not, if there's really a, uh, a substantive problem with it in the sense that it's a, it, the software really is licensed under something that's incompatible with the policy, um, which to, to a point of your question, we did not explicitly set the policy. We worked in conjunction with our legal organization to determine which, uh, what categories of licenses were okay broadly like uh, permissive, permissive licenses, more restrictive licenses, very restrictive licenses, and to categorize the licenses that we found into those buckets so that we could make uh, policy determinations without having to go back and make the attorneys read every single open source license in the world. Um, so we helped get, you know, shape that with them. Uh, but um, uh, if there is a pro if there ends up being a problem, we'll work with the developer team developers that are responsible for it to go through and fix them. But again, so far we haven't found anybody that actually had you know it was a serious problem in the sense that there was a, mm, a completely incompatible license that was against policy that was deeply embedded into the software, and so we had to go out and find another replacement that was under a, under a better license but had equivalent functionality as the, the one that was not allowed. There haven't been any of those cases yet. But if there were, we would definitely want to work with them to, to get it because that's, a, especially if it's a big, you know, that's, that's the big fear is that you would have to rework, a ton, do a ton of engineering rework, not because of anything that's wrong on a technical level, but purely because the policy says that you can't use it. But so far, that has not been, uh, hasn't been a real problem. Questions? All right, thanks very much. I'll be around uh, out at the booth probably this afternoon, so stop by the GitHub booth and chat and grab some stickers, and I'm happy to talk, talk more about any, any of this stuff. Thank you very much.